glass castle. And to complete the afternoon, I would ask all of the graduates to stand and any physicians or dentists who wish to reaffirm the oath since the time of Hippocrates over 2,000 years ago, medical practitioners have taken an oath to uphold the principles of the vocation to which they dedicate themselves in setting forth these principles. The oath serves both as a contract with the community and as an affirmation of the deep commitment to the profession. Today, class of 1969, you stand before family, friends, teachers, and colleagues, poised to join a rich tradition of discovery and healing, being mindful of the debt you owe to the mentorship of those who came before you, while recognizing that your work will inform the practices of those who follow you, have created an oath drawing on elements both ancient and recent. I now invite you as a class to articulate the ideals and principles that will guide you in your journey as physicians and dentists class. I swear, I swear to fulfill, fulfill this covenant. covenant. I pledge, I pledge to, to use my whole spirit, spirit knowledge, and skills to knowledge serve my patients. I will strive to cure where never possible to heal, to the best of my abilities, to the best and to of my comfort abilities, always. And to comfort I will constantly challenge will my biases constantly and assumptions so, so that I can prepare the best care to patients care regardless care of color, free of class, gender, or nationality. I will listen to and honor my patients' stories by protecting their privacy and promoting their interests as they define them. <laughs> That's all I remember. It is 1973. My name is Dr. Charlotte Bronson. I have been acting as a clinical psychiatrist for years and have studied to become one for a much longer period of time. I haven't spoken to you for a long while, and I honestly never expected to speak with you again. But I found him. It took two, or probably more, years of searching to track him down. But here he is. I am looking at him right now. Are his eyes soulless and dead? Or is that just what I want to see? Even after being locked inside this facility for the past three years, he still looks like something 26-year-old Charlotte Bronson would lust for. What a ditz. I wasn't the only one. He has the staff here calling him Charlie now. What's the deal with that? What the hell? So apparently, he has two names, Martin Putnetsky and Charlie Bookman. On the first page of his file here, it has Martin Putnetsky in bold, like all the other patients, and Charlie Bookman in quotations. I don't understand. But I found him. I think I'm ready. The echo can finally end. One moment, please. I think it's time for me to talk to him. I just need to know. Yes? I wanted to make sure everything was all right. You were only in there for about 30 seconds. Everything is fine. Thanks for checking. You should have mentioned something when you opened the door. I had something really important on my mind. Had to get it on tape. In private. I forgot something, too, that I left in there. I'll be out in a second. I'll meet you out there. Okay. Copy that. Charlotte? The man can smile, he can school you in psychology, but he can't touch you while he's wearing that straitjacket. This is why you're here. You need to know. The echo can finally end. How come you're going by the name Charlie now? Hello, my name is Charlie. How have you been, Sunflower? 
Your name is Martin Putnetsky. Many people call you by your new name, the Monster of Kingstown. My name is Charlie. It's nice to meet you. You're very pretty, miss. Fine. Call yourself whatever you want. I know who you are. It took me nearly two years to find you, you know that? Wow. That is a really long time. Martin, drop the act. Say my name. You know it. Say it. Are you Sunflower? I am Charlie. Say my name. My name is Charlie. Do not call me that. Say my name! I don't know. Why are you sad, Sunflower? <laughs> Doc, is everything okay in there? I'm not sure what your research is about, but I'm not sure how much help Charlie is going to be to you here. His name isn't Charlie. Why are you calling him that? Why does it say that in his file? I don't know. The first time I was introduced to him, he went by Charlie. What happened to him? What kind of treatment is he having? You want me to call Dr. Strand down here? He can better answer your questions. Yeah, get him. I need to know what happened to the man who is currently called Charlie. Do you want him to meet you here or in the observation room? Over there would be fine. Thank you, Joe. Tell Dr. Strand that Dr. Bronson wants him down in the observation room ASAP. On it. I copy that, sir. I think that while I wait, I'm going to stay inside here. Just knock when he gets down here. Copy that. Sounds like a plan. Thanks. Charlie? Charlie, look at me. How old are you? What are you saying? I think that me and the nursing staff have done a stellar job of caring for Mr. Bookman. Maybe you can tell me. His name is not actually Charlie Bookman. Why are you calling him that? Charlie Bookman, as his name is today, is known by the average person as the Monster of Kingstown. Okay, what you should know about this patient is that he had many ailments before being put under my care. During his trial, which was fairly public, he admitted to seducing and murdering close to a dozen university students. I know the story. So what, you had his name changed to hide him from public records? No. I questioned it too initially. When he pled guilty, but due to insanity, one of his concessions was that he was allowed to change his name before entering his treatment center. I don't know whose plan that was, his own or his lawyer's, but he did. He picked Charlie Bookman. I looked through his file. There is nothing inside that mentions any major treatments or surgeries that differ from the methods of your other similar patients. There are no patients similar to Charlie. I don't think you understand who exactly this man was. He had the most severe case of borderline personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, psychotic disorder, and what I'm calling narcissistic personality disorder. My other eight patients who are convicted killers seem like average citizens when compared to him. Treatment for him was trial and error. Starting with typical antipsychotics paired with daily counseling seemed to work initially. It seemed that progress was being made. His hypertension lowered and his behavior seemed to steady to normal levels. The result even made me consider lowering his prescription of Thorazine. I forgot to mention that since the day he arrived, he's been harassing the nurses every day. So then one night, a nurse reported his plans to, in summary, conspire to slit my throat, break out, and burn the entire facility down. Our nurses are trained to ignore and redirect the unwanted advances of patients, and he was no exception. She in particular has been with us for years, and thank God she is happily married with a six-month-old at home. So what did you do after you learned his plan? You raised his prescription instead of lowered it, I assume? Yes, and I kept raising it each week. 
and we never noticed a positive impact on him. So about 10 months ago, I ordered a lobotomy upon his prefrontal cortex. Seems to have worked wonders, hasn't it? Prefrontal cortex lobotomy? The same procedure they did on Rosemary Kennedy? Are you serious? Were they not banned a few years back? Not after we requested permission for the procedure from the state. I thought they would deny me as well, and I would have to resort to electroshock therapy. But they were quite amicable with my request. It was a basic procedure. Is he still recovering? Or is he... Is he fully healed? Following a procedure like that, there is usually a lengthy recovery, but I believe that he is reaching the tail end of it. Is he the same person still? Or do you think the person that was there is dead and gone? I talk with Charlie, or as you see him, I assume Martin, every few days. There are fragments, I believe. Following the procedure, one ongoing pattern that I notice is that he repeats some of the same fragments of phrases that he used to say before the procedure. There are echoes in a sense of who he was and who he is now. Just echoes. That's all I heard when I spoke to him, too. Thanks for coming down, Strand. No problem. Let me know if you have any other questions about anything just organizing up there. It's been a while since I've had time to do some cleaning. Should I tell Joel to send in number five? I'm not sure how useful Charlie will be to you. Thank you, but don't tell Joe yet. I want to speak with Charlie some more. I'll see you later, Doctor. How do you like the food here, Charlie? Are you eating well? It's good. I like it here a lot. It's very good. Is there one that's your favorite? Yes. Yeah. I really like the gravy and meatloaf. I like that the best. And what's your favorite part about living here? Do you have a favorite thing that you do each day? Yes. I really like playing checkers. The nurse comes and plays with me after dinner. She is good. She always beats me. You're gonna beat her. I'm sure of it. And Charlie, what makes you get up each morning? Is there something out there that really wakes you up in the morning and gives you energy? I do not know. I... It is... I... I do not know. I... That concludes Dr. Centennial. Thanks again for listening to the show. Hey, if you enjoyed the story you heard, all three episodes, including the teaser, are available at samueltessier.weebly.com. And now for some credits. Dr. Centennial stars the great Sarah Parr as the Dr. Charlotte Bronson. The narrative appearance of our other stellar cast members is as follows. Trevor Warren as the radio announcer. Parker Hughes as Kelly Richards. Edgar J. Bender as performing psychologist. Kevin Dilley as event host. Stanford Lee as the head guard. Justin Usel as Dr. Strand. Kristen Dowling as school board member one. Adam Newborn as school board member two. Alex Funk as school board member three. Christian P.K. Reeve as Professor Panetsky. Nathan K. Kenny as Lance McGill. Karen Laven as Margaret Leachman. Sean McGinnis as Ike Grubel. Christian P.K. Reeve as Charlie Bookman. Alex Funk as the graduation speaker. And Reginald D. Boland as the additional guard. 
It was written and directed by Samuel Tessier and is co-produced by Samuel Tessier and Professor Scott Hallgren's post-production sound class. Our production manager was Haley Kukerl. Arrangements and music supervisors were Jake Keller and Tori Johnson. It was edited and mixed by John Lorenchak and Michael McKenzie. Our sound designer was Jennifer Lohman, and our Foley artist was Julian Villarreal. Additional post-production assistance was provided by Josh Tavera, Maria Joseph, Ryan Tyler Konioff, Samantha Doris, Brooke Knapp, Tony Borales, Lainey Smith, and Sam Irwin. Our mastering was done by Haley Kukerl and Jennifer Lohman. Logo and graphics were done by Audrey Pearson. It was recorded at Black Squirrel Radio with additional work done at the DMP studio. Very special thanks to Katie Cooper, Christopher Knobloch, and Connor Dowling. And of course, a very, very, very special thank you to you, dear listener. Thank you for listening.